Morgan Richard, thank you for joining me this afternoon. Uh, this is a bit of a, a change for us because Dan is not going to be joining us today. And it's, it's a little bit weird for me because it's kind of like when we're at the firehouse, we're, we're sitting there, we're all joking around like crass, obnoxious jokes, like being completely immature. But when we get a call, we go to someone's house for like, uh, you know, an asthma attack or something. Everyone's got to lock it up. Like we're all consummate professionals, which we are anything but, <laughs> but we have to, you know, put that facade on for that short period of time before we drop them off at the hospital and then resume the, de the degeneracy that we normally are at. So I, that's how I'm feeling right now. I feel like I don't have the, the firehouse backup here that I normally do. But so Morgan, I'm going to lean on you heavily to inject some crass humor into this thing. There you go. I'll do my best. The last time right. I saw you and Dan, Dan was on his mother-in-law's porch um, because I think he is doing like some sort of home renovation. And he oh, had yeah, trains he was his going roof by put on his and there were that's acorns right. falling on, the, <laughs> on there. So, you know, it might be a better outcome this time without him if he were to be on his mother-in-law's porch again. So Yeah. Yeah, I think he tries to spend as little time on his mother-in-law's porch as possible. I mean, that's how I always have been anyway. How are you today? What's going on? Yeah, yeah, things are good. Thank God. Um, it's a beautiful day here in Austin, Texas. And um, yeah, I my kids are all safe and happy. So what else can a mom ask for? Sweet. Yeah, no screaming kids benefit. Huge, yeah, huge yeah. bonus. I know all <laughs> about that. Uh, so this this episode is going to focus a lot, a lot on financial planning because you are a CFA and that's what you do professionally. And I think um, as we work our way into this, it's important to keep in mind that, I mean, we're getting a lot of new listeners who are probably very new to Bitcoin and are listening to these things as an education to kind of figure out what it is they've got themselves into and explore the dynamics of it and where it's going to go for them. And then we've got another cohort of people that have probably been stacking Bitcoin for like a minimum of four years and have probably accumulated a decent amount of wealth as the value of Bitcoin goes up. So if we can, as we work our way through this, it'd be cool to kind of address each of those cohorts because I mm -hmm. think there's probably a pretty even split at this point. It's hard to say though from our numbers, but I wanna to try to address both of them. And yeah, I do wanna say good. off the top that if you are new to this and you're listening to the, some of these podcasts for the first time, you're trying to understand what you've got yourself into here, <laughs> be prepared for a lot of volatility. Number one, don't try to get cute trade stuff around or take leverage those are just trust me i've never taken leverage but i've definitely traded around and it's at best 50 50 and i would have to say probably most of the time i'm losing it's 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 going to the casino overall yeah, for sure so just be prepared to strap into this thing for like a, i would say a minimum of like four years what do you think about that idea morgan for, for yeah, brand new so entrance to this Maybe your listeners will appreciate this. I don't know if you have a lot of listeners that are into sports, but let's say like batting averages, right? So you look at a batting average and it's just the average of like what a guy, when he gets to the plate, what he can hit, right? Whether or not he right. hits the ball and he gets on base. And so like trading is basically like that. You have a probability every single time. And so even if you're like the best trader, you're above average, you are getting it 70% right at the time. The first trade, right? 70% right. The second trade, you multiply that out. So now you're at less than 50%. Right? right and so right. forth and so you keep going down <laughs> exactly every time and because it's most, an average yeah right mm -hmm. and the most dangerous thing is is the first if you take that first swing and you hit a grand slam you, you suddenly think that you know what you're doing and you're a genius and then that's when you push all the chips in and you play that game again and you strike out and then it's game over you've just for you know, sure you just blew it up for i think sure. that's the so, biggest biggest danger a lot of people have is that gambling mentality yeah, definitely. And I would say like your holding period should be as long as it can be. So people like to look at the four year cycle because they say, OK, well, there's havings every four years. And traditionally, there's been a run up over those four years. And if you were able to hold for four years, you turned out to be OK. And so I would push back against that, um, not because right we've seen anything different through the cycles. But as we're approaching the having here, people have expectations and people had expectations last time from the having too. they thought that the price was going to go way higher than it actually did. Um, people made decisions based on that. And so I would say, stop looking at the four year cycle and start just looking at long term money. That's yeah. what Bitcoin is. It's long term savings. It's not some short term investment. And so when we advise clients on, let's say, buying stocks versus bonds, right, we would never tell a client, 
well, you just have to hold this stock for four years and you'll probably be okay. Right? Right. That's generally not the advice ever that any, you know, any financial planner would give. What they say is like, okay, 10 years or more, right, is what we're looking at this. And stocks are like a 30 year asset, really, when you think right. about it, because you go through many cycles with it. And so Bitcoin to me is something like that too, um, where you want to be holding this for, you know, 10, 20, 30 years. Like that's how you should be looking at it. And so matching very long-term liabilities with something like Bitcoin is the, is the right way to look at it. And when I use the word liability, I don't mean like, paying off a mortgage or something like that, or paying off credit card debt, which is how people typically think of liabilities. I think of it as the liability of what you're going to be doing in the future. So for some people that's paying for, let's say, kids education in 20 years from now, or for some people that's retiring in 30 years from now. So for some people that's, you know, making a legacy. Um, for some people, I don't know, it's retiring and taking a trip around the world, right? There's so many things or paying off student loan debt, right? These are some long term cyclical things that happen in people's lives that they need to plan for. And right. Bitcoin is the perfect vehicle for something like that. Yeah. And it's also like everyone has this propensity and it's understandable. Everyone wants to get rich now. But if you look at the people that actually do get rich in a hurry, like lottery winners are a great example. They get all the money, but they don't have any of the experience or understanding of how to properly use it. And so a vast majority of them end up going from zero to, you know, say 5 million and back to zero, a giant round trip in a few years because they squander all the money on, on toys or whatever it is, or give it all away. The, if get re getting wealthy slowly, you kind of, a, you, you accumulate the experience and understanding of how to properly maneuver this stuff without giving your, you know, getting yourself into a car accident financially. Uh, I think yeah. that is the, it's the slow road, right? Like Warren Buffett, obviously the guy, um, he's a good example. He's been not selling and building for 70 something years at, at this point. What is he like 90 years old? He, <laughs> Yeah, he's the perfect crazy. example. He's he still lives. I mean, I'm not saying if you make some money, you shouldn't buy a toy here and there and like enjoy yourself. It's kind of crazy that he still lives in the same house in Omaha being worth like, I don't even know what it is today, $70 billion, but yeah. maybe not quite that miserly, but that's the right idea to like, you know, control your spending, invest in assets primarily, and then just keep reinvesting for as long as you can before you go buy the moon Lamborghini. Yeah, definitely. There's a story about Warren Buffett where apparently he was just so into his work that his son had fallen on their staircase in, in his house and he just stepped over him and kept going upstairs into his office. Really? So, it's like, yeah. <laughs> so I think it's like it takes a personality for sure to like most people are not going to do that, obviously, if their right. child is hurt on the stairs. And so I Never think for most one. people, right, like they often look at, let's say, the Warren Buffetts of the world and they think, OK, well, you know, I just if I can just get this investment right or do this thing right, then, you know, in um, in many, many years, I will be very wealthy. The thing about it, though, is, right, if you're if you make some good decisions early on and you're really good about just saving your income, right, you have income coming in, you have expenses going out, you make sure that you have a surplus of 20 percent or more of that income. That's just a good rule of thumb for most people. You're going to be fine. It's going to take a while, right, because you kind of have to chip away at it at the beginning. But then you have the power of compounding on the on the backside, right, because right. like the more you can kind of accumulate early, then time's on your side. And so I think people often forget about that with Warren Buffett. He did do a lot of the, the work on like picking really good companies early on. And then now, like, he's just sort of benefiting from all that work there because he has time on his side. As you said, he's very, very old. So yeah. um, that's my best hope, right? Obviously, for every Bitcoiner is that, you know, you live to be as old as Moses, you live to be 120 years old, and that you have the power of compounding on your side. And as long as you manage your spending properly, you'll be okay. Yeah, that is unbelievable, too. If you go to a compound interest calculator and you put in, say, I'm going to put $1,000 a month into an account at 5% for, say, five years versus 30 years, and just look at the way that grows after, say, 20 years, especially. It's, mm -hmm. it's amazing. Um, I think Einstein said there were a couple of things he didn't understand, and one of them was compound interest. And yeah. <laughs> it's unbelievable how much that ramps up. It's an exponential curve after, say, year 25 or so, and it just keeps growing after that. So, yeah, great advice. Uh, yeah, on the other sure. end of the and spectrum, I think it does like add to the disparity of why people feel like the wealthy keep getting wealthier while, you know, everyone you know, has to try very hard to get ahead. And it's because like there is the power of compounding on their side. So as long as you were able to get to a place where, you know, you have enough time then for power to compound, it's yeah, it could be really quite amazing. Right. And I think the wealthy also, while we're on that, they just understand that the, they want to own assets, not dollars. You know, I think poor people or just middle class people generally, they're looking for dollars in the bank account. I think wealthy people are generally looking for that rare property or they're looking for something that is going to retain and gain value, rare art, all these things that they collect. They don't sit on hordes of billions of dollars. I'm sure Zuckerberg doesn't have a billion dollars in a bank account. You know, he's, he's, he's buying sure. property in Hawaii and building a, I don't know what he's building out there. It's some kind of ridiculous 
Uh, I know he has a goat named Bitcoin, though, so maybe well, he'll be the guy. Does he have a goat named Bitcoin? He does. I mean, I'm sure he it does. bleats, you know, huddle. <laughs> yeah, yeah, it has to, right? Probably has a hog <laughs> named Bitcoin or a <laughs> hog named Sat, maybe. I don't know. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That's fine. Um, so for the other end of the spectrum, we talked about people that are kind of new to this whole game at this point. But So for people that have been playing this now for five, six, maybe even ten years who have accumulated in Bitcoin a lot of wealth at this point, at least compared to what they thought maybe they'd ever have in their life. Um, let's talk about some do's and don'ts maybe for like how to handle that kind of wealth. Like what is just some general advice you'd give to somebody who has made significant amounts of money in Bitcoin and they're thinking to themselves at this point, like, wow, I am very heavy Bitcoin. And I think maybe it's time for me to, as this thing rides up this bull market, I should take a little bit off the table and I should, maybe I want to buy I don't want to, let's just start with like, what should they do if they want to keep it all invested? Like what are some yeah. general, what's some general advice for keeping it invested? So I mean, I think this is just advice we would give anybody in any situation where they have any kind of windfall. So it applies to Bitcoin, right? Because there's a lot of sudden, there's sudden wealth that happens in, in an asset like Bitcoin where, you know, if you do get the 100x return or whatever during a cycle, right, all of a sudden you went from not having very much money to having very, like a lot of money overnight. Um, and this phenomenon happens not just to Bitcoiners, right? It happens to people who get options through a company that all of a sudden goes public or a family member dies and gives somebody money they didn't know about, right? These things are... They're not they're not common, obviously, but they do happen. And, and we have actually a lot of data on how people should handle this. And the first thing that people should always do is stop, <laughs> because I feel like as soon as people get more get money, they're like, OK, so I'm going to get a boat. I'm going to build a pool. I'm going to get a new car. I'm going to yep. pay off my mortgage. I'm going to send all my kids to private school. Right. And all of a sudden, like this big pot of money, like you spent it all the first five years or whatever, and then you're broke. And so that's I think the phenomenon also of like what we were talking about with lottery winners is that they don't actually think about how much money you need to last for a really long period of time. And so this kind of, I think, means that people need to stop, pause, reflect on their current financial situ situation and actually start running some numbers. And for most people, that's like the last thing that they want to do because, you know, you're like high on the numbers, you right. want to pop campaign, you want to take your wife out somewhere nice, right? You want to like finally get your kid that toy that they've been wanting for a really long time because you have finally have the money to do it. And I would say, okay, just like we like a week. <laughs> <laughs> right. just take a just take a breath here all right like let's see how much money do you have on regularly coming in how much money do you have going out for expenses okay how much are you planning to increase your expenses and then how much of that like what percentage is that of like where you want your expenses to be versus how much money you actually have um and so for most people right if you're in i mean most people are going to have a 30 year time horizon kind of no matter what age they are and the reason why i say that is because for most people when they're in their 70s 80s and 90s even though maybe they're not necessarily going to live to be 140. Um, they probably have other goals and things that live beyond them with their money. And so there's always some sort of 30 year time horizon that people are looking at. Um, sometimes more than that, right? If you're a 30 year old who um, just got sudden wealth and you're going to retire right now, your retirement period is much, much larger than 30 years. Um, and so you have to think about what the withdrawal rate on that is. So somebody who, let's say, gets a million dollars, they're like, wow, I've never had this much money in my life, but a million dollars is actually only $40,000 a year in spending. And so if you're spending more than $40,000 a year, you can't actually retire on a million dollars, especially if you're 25 years old. And so I think that like people need to take a step back. There have been some other studies too, um, the one that comes to mind is the Trinity study. It was done by Bill Bengen. And so this study is where people held 50% of their assets in stocks and 50% of their assets in bonds. And what they did is they looked at rolling 30 year periods of how much money people can take out from their accounts and still have that money last. And so um, the reason why they looked at the rolling periods too was so that people can could basically go through bear market cycles. And right. what they found was that people could last through a 30 year period of time with a 4% withdrawal rate, kind of no matter what the situation was, they can get through really, really bad times. That does also assume that they're adjusting their spending along the way. And so there's, you know, Obviously, most people don't do that, right? So if right. you're actually going to follow it to the T, you have to be adjusting your spending and doing everything according to the rules, and then your money will last. Um, with Bitcoin, though, I've now done a lot of work on this because I've been thinking about, okay, what's a safe withdrawal rate for Bitcoiners? And Bitcoin's not a compounding asset. And so Bitcoin seems like a compounding asset, right? Because in dollar terms, it increases in value, right? Because it's, it's grown as a currency. There are more people using it, right? There's a supply cap. There's all sorts of 
properties and reasons why people like you and me want to own Bitcoin, right? And so that is what's making it go up in value in terms of dollars, right? But there's only 21 million Bitcoin, right? And one Bitcoin equals one Bitcoin. And there's a reason why there's all these tropes and um, mm -hmm. and memes in Bitcoin mm -hmm. about these things is because it literally, it's true. <laughs> right. You don't get more Bitcoin just because you're sitting on Bitcoin. It's not like yield farming. And so people want to do all this fiat yield farming stuff with their Bitcoin because they want it to compound. But really what you have to think about is, okay, this asset, how do I make it last? And so what I've been doing for clients now is actually taking like assuming that people are going to live to 100 and taking um, distribution rates based on that. And so they're significantly lower, right? Because like if let's say you're 50 and you're going to we're hoping you live to 100, right? You're only taking out 2% per year because 100 divided by 50, that's your withdrawal rate. So you basically yeah. just take 100 divided are you by your age. And that you can, in, yeah. Are you talking about 2% in Bitcoin itself or in fiat denominated like the fiat denominated amount i guess it's the same thing really it is the same thing but yeah, yeah it is bitcoin right so if you had one bitcoin right that you could basically spend 0.02 bitcoin per year and you would last right until you were 100 by doing so so it's just your age divided by 100 and yep, that's your withdrawal rate and so um it's actually makes retirement planning really simple which is kind of cool um but then people are like whoa wait hey hang on i need like way more, <laughs> way more money than i thought if i'm living on this fixed amount of bitcoin and so what i do tell people is that yeah yeah, today you do, right? Today in dollar terms, you do. But if like Bitcoin goes maybe to a price target that, you know, I don't have any price targets, but like, let's assume somebody has, you know, a million dollar price target right now, your fiat withdrawals, even though you're only taking out 0.02 Bitcoin, right? Like we just said, it obviously is comparably larger than it would be today. And so right. these are things that I think people should consider. Um, and, and then what it really does mean is that, okay, once I'm doing all this math, even though I have this large windfall, if the math checks out and says, okay, now I can go do whatever it is that I was going to do, then you go do it. You have a green light. If it doesn't, though, right now we're in a situation where you're like, okay, well, maybe I either need to wait longer, save more, increase income, decrease expenses, right? There's all these levers that you can pull on in the financial planning world to make the math work. It's just that people often don't want to pull on those levers, right? They just, they want their instant right. gratification. They want their Amazon package on their doorstep. And they're like, Bitcoin hit, you know, 70,000 and I want to be retired. And it's like, okay, well, you know, maybe that's not necessarily right for your situation. Um, yeah. And so you just have to think about how you can change things up either in your financial situation or wait longer. And um, yeah, that's my best advice for people when they, when they have a windfall. Okay. What about as far as... um let's say that somebody made, you know, let's say they're at like say $5 million or something like that. And they're, they're thinking about buying toys at this point. Like, mm -hmm. is there, do you have like a ratio where you're like, all right, this is a, a pretty good uh, like rule of thumb as far as like how much money you should spend on some toys to reward yourself for having killed it? Or like, how do you kind of make that calculation? Yeah, I think it does also go back to what we were saying before of like, okay, if I am going to be spent, if I have $5 million and I need all 5 million of that to last, right, then I can't spend any of it on a right. Lamborghini or a tractor. Or I don't know what people want to spend money on a boat, you know, <laughs> you right. name it. Um, but if you do, right, if you've done that math and there's money left over and you don't actually need that money right now, you can start taking percentages of that and decide like, okay, I'm going to allocate some here. I'm going to allocate some there because I've realized that of that $5 million, Maybe I only need four million to actually live on for the next, you know, 50, 100 years, whatever it is, um, and make my legacy. And then with the remaining pot, right, depending if you're single or if you're married, right, maybe have a discussion with your wife about whether or not <laughs> she yeah. also wants the big tractor. Don't tell your wife how much money you made. Don't tell her. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> Uh, I know if it were my son, he'd be like, okay, we're getting an excavator and this is where we're going to store it. <laughs> and we're just going to dig holes in the yard all day. And I'm yeah, like, that sounds I great. I mean, my do son that. does enough damage with a single shovel. I would yeah, not want to even see what would happen if he had a hold of an excavator. Be, it wouldn't be pretty. I'd be getting kicked Make out of the neighborhood. Make it to China for sure. <laughs> yeah. Um, so you mentioned the 4%. Well, it sounds like your basically rule of thumb is the 4% rule, which like people in their like retire early communities they basically talk about the 4% rule, which is you make the assumption of like an 8% return rate and you spend half of that. And that's kind of like, if you can retire on that 4% of your net worth, then you're good to go. And well, in fiat. Yes, so right, right. In fiat, yes. In fiat, 4% is going to be fine, um, depending on your age too. I mean, there are other factors like what we've seen with, with studies is that spending starts to drop off when you're 78 or older. 
Um, that may change over time, right? Baby boomers are starting to do more things for longer. And so it might just be a trend now that people over the age of 78 actually do continue to spend as much money or more money than what they were spending today. Um, but what we've seen so far is that spending does drop off at 78. And so you actually, because of that, can have a higher withdrawal rate, let's say at age 70, because knowing that your spending is going to go down, let's say in eight years. Um, so there's like some math. There's no I guess what I'm saying is that, yes, there are rules of thumb. In fiat, 4% is generally like the number that you can look at. 5% uh, is still probably going to be fine. Most foundations use 5% uh, withdrawal rate as like their rule of like, this is how much we actually need to withdraw and have that in our documents. And 5% also could last a pretty long time. 5.5% for people 70 and up who are already retired, somewhere between 55 and 6% actually could work. Um, but being able to curtail in the in like the harder years is is generally why people use these lower withdrawal numbers and yep. so um there's no i guess there is a rule of thumb right the four percent is kind of the thing that you can rely on but with bitcoin it's much lower so um like unless you're 99 and retiring you know <laughs> <laughs> in Bitcoin, right? You've got to be looking at significantly lower withdrawal rates. Um, I do actually have an actuarial chart that I've um, I've published on this. It's on the Bitcoin Financial Advisors Network blog. Uh, and so people can check it out there. There's a, a post that I put out about retirement planning and people can check out what they think their withdrawal rate could be. Um, assuming that you live to age 100, you would adjust it if you think that you're going to die sooner or you would adjust it again if you think you're going to live a lot longer, right? And so yeah. I think for most people, 100 is probably enough years. Okay. <laughs> Have you been paying attention the last few years? If so, you know one thing. Not your keys, not your coins. This is a quaint saying, but it's real. If you're not holding your seed keys, you have a Bitcoin IOU, not Bitcoin. CoinKite is the maker of the cold card Mark IV. This is the industry standard for holding the keys to your Bitcoin. Holding your keys should not be intimidating, and it isn't. The Mark IV makes this an incredibly simple process. You could be a degenerate firefighter and hold your own keys. That's how simple it is. If you want to create a more complex setup, the Cold Card Mark IV has you covered there as well. You can create a multi-sig using a cold card, a tap signer, and even the upcoming Q1. Speaking of the Q1, if you want to have every bell and whistle and give yourself no boundaries as far as interacting with Bitcoin is concerned, the Q1 is your signing device. CoinKite makes some of the most sought-after gear in Bitcoin. The block clock, seed plates, the open dime, and the sats card. Everything you need to secure your Bitcoin. Use code BCB for 5% off the Mark IV. Juan's mission is to help millions of people get into Bitcoin. So they built the fastest and easiest way to get started. It's just a matter of minutes to sign up and start buying Bitcoin with the Swan app. Introducing friends and family to Bitcoin has never been easier. And Swan now has zero fees on the first $10,000 worth of Bitcoin buys, so it's free to get started. But don't worry. If you're already a Swan client, your next 10K of buys are also free. If you love to recommend Bitcoin, and I know you do, Swan is a no-brainer. You can now take a friend from zero to Bitcoin in one quick conversation. Just tell them to search for Swan Bitcoin in their app store. It's really just a few minutes and completely free to get started. Again, search Swan Bitcoin to download the app. Okay. So <laughs> while we're on the topic of, of well, we kind of started uh, about adjusting your portfolio, right? Mm -hmm. uh, off the top of my head, there's a few different things that I think there's people in Bitcoin would probably be, maybe they're not like super pumped about, but there are things that are pretty obvious, like the S&P 500, maybe some real estate, like income producing real estate, maybe even gold seems to be doing pretty well lately. I think gold will probably do well, at least as well as it's done traditionally, which is keep up with inflation. Um, what about treasuries? What are your opinions? I mean, obviously that's a huge um, ball of wax. There's a lot of different kinds of treasuries. There's a lot of different... <laughs> What is, what's your opinion on each one of those avenues? Yeah, so I think if you're, so let's back up, right? You're in a situation where, okay, you contributed a normal portion of your salary or paycheck to saving in Bitcoin, right? You didn't, you know, or or even you contributed an above average percentage, right? And now all of a sudden you, you realize that like Bitcoin's 90 plus percent of your net worth. And you're like, okay, well, now I'm in a situation where for whatever reason, I want to diversify. Um, and now I'm looking at other assets. And so I think that this part is where it really does depend. And I know that people don't like to hear this answer because they're like, oh, it's cop out. And she's just trying to get me to come uh, use her services. And I actually 
I mean, I'm happy to help people. I'm also happy to refer people. There are other people who do Bitcoin financial planning. Um, yeah. But this is really where um, if you're not exactly sure where to put your assets afterwards, like a financial planner can actually really help you in this regard of helping you diversify and helping you at least mitigate taxes while you're doing it. Um, but right there are there is a large swath of assets that are available to you. So um, the, the way that I look at these buckets is like, okay, how, when do I need these assets? Do I need them in the short term or do I need them in the long term? Like, why is it that I'm selling? If I'm, am I selling just because I don't like, uh, like the risk that I'm taking at this point, it's beyond my risk tolerance right now you're okay. If I'm, if it's beyond my risk tolerance, now you have to consider, okay, it's, is putting it in stock still within my risk tolerance or is that actually also beyond my risk tolerance to be like half Bitcoin, half stocks, right? So that these are questions that people need to ask themselves. And then when you're looking at your risk tolerance, it's like, okay, this risk tolerance makes up willingness and ability to take risk. People always think about the willingness to take risk, which is like, you know, the person who skydives is much, it's like much right. more risky than the person who's like, I can't even dig a hole in my backyard in case, you know, my son hits the sprinkler system, right? And so there, <laughs> there's going to be a difference there, right? But it's also with money, right? Even somebody who skydives might actually think that they should only be in U.S. Treasury bills for the rest of their life. And so right. um, you have to think about it in terms of money. Um, generally, people who like to gamble or do, you know, place bets are much more likely to like have a higher risk tolerance than somebody who isn't. Um, but then ability, right? So ability is like, do you have regular income? Um, do you have a pretty large stash of assets now that you've accumulated or not, right? Like these are going to contribute. Somebody who has more assets can take more risk than somebody who has less assets. Somebody who has more stable income can take right. more risk than somebody who has age less stable well. income. Like where yep, are you at? Age, are you about horizon. to retire or are you 20 years away from your potential retirement, right? Yeah, for sure. And so there's a lot of factors, like there's unique situations where, you know, do you need this money in one to three years because you're paying for your kid's school or you're going to buy a house or you you need to help aging parents or you're starting a business, right? There's all sorts of things that can play into why all of a sudden your time horizon gets shorter. Oh, and yeah. so when you're thinking about that, like of diversifying, it's like, okay, why am I diversifying? What's my risk tolerance? And then where do I want to put it as a result of that? And so anything that you need in sh like short-term money should be in short-term assets, which is going to be like fiat cash and fiat short-term bonds, right? Anything mm -hmm. that you don't need for a long time, right? Can stay in something like Bitcoin, can stay in something like stocks, can be in something like real estate, right? And so you can sort of Think about how you want to diversify in that regard. Yeah. So you mentioned the the T word taxes. We're at what? What are we at? April eleventh today. It's in like four days. We're all going to get raped and pillaged by Uncle <laughs> Sam. Um, so that that's a huge component of this, right? Like financial planning, and I I would have to say for myself that is that's the biggest black box in this whole conversation for me is is putting yourself in a position that when you move your financial stuff around that you're not putting yourself in a bad spot as far as taxes are concerned. And I think that's probably what a lot of people come to you for and a lot of other financial advisors because they're worried or if they're smart, they're worried that they're going to make a giant mistake and pay egregious amount of taxes in some way or another. Um, can you tell us about some of the most common mistakes people make as far as that, as far as taxes are concerned and maybe a couple of strategies to mitigate taxes on if you wanted to say move yourself from that 90% Bitcoin portfolio to like a 50% Bitcoin portfolio, which is a massive move for mm -hmm. a lot of people, you know, like which, and you think about the tax implications of that, it could be catastrophic, probably catastrophic, whether or not you even use the strategies you're going to, you know, advise. Yeah. So, I mean, the first thing I would say is that I hope I, I have given some tax advice leading up to this podcast about like tax loss harvesting, taking advantage of like sort of the loopholes that are available to you. So if you've been tax loss harvesting this whole time through the bear market up to this point, then hopefully you've accumulated enough of a loss where you can use that to offset. If you haven't been doing that right, don't fret. There's still other things, right? But you're not going to like be able to basically save as much money Wait, before as you, you keep going on. Would. Mm -hmm. Tax loss harvesting that that allows you to take, if I remember correctly, it's like, is it only three thousand dollars a year in, in yeah, losses? Yeah, so it's three thousand dollars a year in losses if you don't have any other gains. In a year that you have gains, you actually can take those back losses and oh, put them against the gain. Yeah, I didn't know that. That's a really <laughs> good point. So then, and so okay. in like you know the year where Bitcoin was trading around twenty thousand, right? That would have been a good year if you had bought at sixty k to sell at twenty, buy back, right? Now you have this loss that you're basically you're carrying forward three thousand per year in your but, taxes, but now you can use the the big chunk of it to offset gains right. later on. But there's a caveat to that, right? Like if you 
Um, if you buy the same asset back within 30 days, you're not allowed to use that loss. Is that correct? I know that. Yeah. So the caveat to it is that they didn't um, actually outlaw that loophole, though, on Bitcoin. They So if you did it with like GBTC or something like that, the, the ETFs didn't exist, right, when we're talking about this period of time. And so okay. if you did it with GBTC or if you're doing it now with an ETF, then no, you have to go, go out of the asset for 30 days and then come back in. Um, okay. And if you don't wait that 30 day period, then, yeah, it's called a wash sale and it's just allowed um in bitcoin though however they did not there was a loophole basically because it's property it's not an, it's an, it's not an investment and so you were able to sell it and buy it back um pretty much instantaneously and you were able to take that loss so is that um, still in effect now you can still do that uh, yeah, it actually is still in effect now. Um, oh, I think okay. what's going to be difficult for people, right, is that unless they bought at the tippy tippy top of the <laughs> of the bull market, yeah, you're, 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 right, you're fucked right loss. now. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> uh, I wish and I would have so, asked you about this the last time we spoke because I think that would have been a good time for me to play that game. <laughs> Like, God damn it. Um, but don't fear. Bitcoin will probably go down in the future and you will be able to use the strategy if it's still open. Um, and so that's one thing. Um, the next thing is that if you're looking to, okay, let's say Bitcoin hits your price target and you're like, okay, I'm ready to start selling some Bitcoin. Um, that's a good year to make sure maybe that you do some like asset shifting. So if you're working for a company, maxing out a 401k or 403b to lower taxable income, that way you don't pay as much on capital gains or because they basically look at these buckets of how you're doing things and so your income can get like let's say put over a certain amount and then you can pay more on capital gains as a result of that and so i don't know the bucks off the top of my head because they keep changing over time but i think yeah. it's somewhere around 450 in income if you're over 450k in income including that capital gains you start paying 23.8 percent in taxes so you want to try to keep your capital gain as much in the 15 percent bracket as you can right because right. you don't want to pay that extra 8.8 percent that's another question. So longer term capital gains year plus, uh, are they 15%? Is that correct? Yeah. So longer term capital gains, there's actually like a 0% bracket and then there's a 15% bracket and then there's a 23.8% bracket. And so okay. the so 0%... worst case scenario is 23.8. Okay. Mm -hmm. Yeah, worst case scenario. And also, if you live in a state with state tax, you're also going to pay state tax on top of that. So people don't think like if you're in the Californias and New Yorks of the world, right, and you're in that 23.8 percent bracket, you're not tacking on another 10 to 15 percent on top of that yeah. um, if you're living in a state with high state income tax. So um, that's just something else to consider. So um, move to Montana, then yeah. <laughs> cash out. OK, got it. Yeah, yeah. Move, move to Texas, move to Tennessee. Um, Washington state has no state tax, but they actually do have a capital gains tax. So I wouldn't recommend that state if you're going to do this strategy. Strategy. Um, the other thing is that you want to make sure that you're actually taking long term capital gains. So let's say for whatever reason you decide to buy on May 1st of 2023. Right. And you're like today it hit your price target. Maybe it might make sense right, to wait till May 2nd of 2023 right. instead of selling on April 11th when we're recording this. So Got these it. are yep. just some things to consider. Right. That like because now all of a sudden you're taking what would have been short term capital gains and in, in, in your income tax bracket and you're shifting it to a capital gains. bracket. For sure. Um, but there's also there's you got to. Also... You, you probably should Sorry. make a spreadsheet for this as well, because there is a potential that it hasn't gone up so much since you made that last sale that it could, even though it's a higher rate, you might pay less. You know what I mean? Yeah, Depending yeah, on... for sure. So it does depend on your income, whether or not um, you pay more or less in in the um, income tax or capital gains. That That is a yeah. good point. This the is... other thing to consider is um, is there is a 0% capital gains tax rate. And so for some people, right, if you're married, and you're making less than $90,000 a year, some of that capital gain is actually going to be taxed at 0%. Um, whereas like if you shift it to income tax rate, you're going to be paying more than 0%. So there are capital gains um, buckets. And yeah. so that 0% will not apply, right? If you're a high income earner, you don't get that 0% bracket. You'll either be in the 15 or the 23.8% bracket, um, but that's just another way. So like, for instance, if you know, okay, I'm, I'm retired or I know I'm going to retire next year um, and not really have very much income, like maybe it does, maybe I don't like sell it this year. Maybe I do wait till next year because a lot of my capital gain will now be in the 0% tax bracket. Okay. One other question. This is a little bit in the weeds, and mm -hmm. but I think it's applicable for a lot of people. Can you decide which kind of accounting method you're going to use when you decide to sell? Like, for example, using first in, first out. So that would be the, the most recent Bitcoin purchases are the ones getting sold or last in, first out, which would be like your, the ones you bought longest ago. 
And so it's actually vice versa. First in, first out is the one that you bought first. So oh, did the, I say it backwards? Like, yeah, and then <laughs> last in, last out. And last in, last out is going to be the the one you bought last and you sold. Um, okay. Yeah, and there's also something called specific purchase. And so you it's, so you can actually pick like highest cost to sell against. That's what I generally recommend people do. Like unless you've got these massive losses, right, that you can use to offset, which most people don't, thank God, have, right? Hopefully right. you're not in a situation where you're carrying forward like millions of dollars of losses and, you know, it doesn't matter where you sell your Bitcoin price. Um, um, but if you're not right, what you want to do is you want to pick the highest cost lots and you want to say that those are the ones that you sold. And so there's some questions in the Bitcoin community about like, OK, uh, like uh, related to the UTXO set, is that specific UTXO set the one that I sent back to the exchange to sell? And my point on this is the IRS doesn't have guidance on this yet. And you are allowed to do specific like specific lots in um, in traditional finance. And so um, as of now, you are still allowed to basically pick the specific lots right that you want to sell that are highest cost and offset those against whatever you, it is that you sold. And that is what we generally recommend. That exactly. said, right, if rules change and the IRS makes it clear that that's not how you have to do it and you either need to pick like LIFO, FIFO, or if you're going to do highest cost, it actually has to be the specific UTXO set that you did. You have to find that UTXO set and so forth, right? Obviously, that's going to get more complicated. That's, that's not how it is right now. Um, and so, and I think honestly, it's so complicated for the IRS that I'm not sure how long it'll take them to implement something like that. So in the meantime, yes, just keep really good, like spreadsheet data of their, your cost basis. Um, if you're like a hardcore Bitcoiner and you're not a trader, right? If you're just like going to buy some Bitcoin over time, then it's actually going to be a lot easier for you to accumulate like a nice spreadsheet with your cost basis. If right. you're like, you know, dollar cost averaging on a daily basis, I generally recommend against that because the accounting is so complicated in doing That's so, like right? That like... It's not worth doing that, right? Maybe switch to a weekly buy or a monthly buy. It's going to be okay. Um, you're, yeah, you're basically <laughs> describing me to a T. Like I was looking through that like daily buys, which I've been doing for a long time. And I'm like, holy shit. Like whenever I have to figure this out, it's going to be an absolute nightmare to, to figure this all out. But Hopefully, uh, ChatGPT can figure it out for me. You know, I'll just I'll just there's input all that some, in there. Like, sort this out for me. There's software too. I think it's like Bitcoin Tax has like a software, uh, and obviously, like there's privacy concerns associated with putting all right. your Bitcoin data into it. So, like that's something to consider. Um, you can just use a good old fashioned spreadsheet. That's what I do in my practice. We just collect data from you know whatever exchange you purchased at, wherever you got it, right, and we just start compiling it. Yeah. Um, and then we make like a nice spreadsheet of average price versus all the different lots. And then we start notating which ones we sold, right? It can get complicated for sure. Um, but it is worth doing. And I would say that if you haven't already done that, this is like what you should be doing now, especially if you're gearing up to like say, okay, I know during this bull market or whenever I hit, whenever it happens to hit, you know, 150K, I don't know what people's price targets are, that then I'm going to start selling. If you don't have all that other data in place before you start selling, right? Now you're going to be scrambling before April 15th of 2025 to make sure that you get everything in order to file your taxes and so yeah that's me um, every single year anyway so i mean it won't change much it'll just be a little <laughs> bit shittier that year than normal yeah yeah yeah. there you go so if you don't care about how um how hard it is then that's no big deal but if you do then i would start compiling that now yeah. um and then there are other tax strategies that you can use in that year so if you're a business owner like make sure you take all the deductions you can obviously like you know don't do anything illegal don't put run things through your business that aren't actually business expenses that's not what i'm saying and i don't want anyone who's listening that's to this exactly to think that what that's what saying. i'm saying <laughs> or, you know like if you were going to like maybe you shift a purchase to 2024 instead of 2025 or like if you were going to pay your insurance or your rent anyways um, in January of 2025, you make sure you pay for it in 2024. You can do things like yep. that. Um, or like if you can shift for whatever paying out, or like um, getting income, right? If somebody's going to pay you on December 31st, like maybe you don't cash that check until January 15th, right? You could do things like that where you can lower income and increase deductions in the year that you're taking capital gains to sort of offset some of the things that you're doing. Um, there's charitable contributions that you can make. You can, if you were feeling charitable anyways, and you were going to maybe make right. charitable contributions, uh, you can You like, should create that charity and then don't it to yourself and then you know you're it's all copacetic from there right that's that's you can well i i mean i i'm on the honor code here so i don't recommend that <laughs> that's obvious but... that's a joke for anyone listening i'm not saying and josh don't is totally fraudulently joking. create any yeah. uh you know non-for-profit organizations to donate to uh, but you can do like a donor advice fund. Um, if you were going to, let's say, give, you know, five grand a year anyways to charity, right? In the year that you are taking your big capital gain, maybe you put 45 grand into a donor advice fund and then you give that over the next nine years, right? There are other things that you can do to lower taxable income. You can also just donate appreciated Bitcoin. You could do kind of like a donate and replace where you donate the ones that you bought, let's say in 2018, and then you replace it with new Bitcoin if you didn't actually want to like 
you know, get rid of that Bitcoin. So these are ways to just mm. to kind of like calibrate your taxes. Yeah. The tax code is such a murky, like 10,000 tome nightmare to deal with. Like, I don't know how, I don't know how CPAs do it. I would hang myself. I think every time I call my CPA, I'm like, especially because I only, I only talk to him when it's tax season because that's when anyone talks to a CPA. Right. And it just sounds like he wants to hang himself every single time. I'm like, man, you, you chose this. I'm sorry. He's actually only wants to hang himself because he has to deal with your taxes. <laughs> that might be true. <laughs> Everybody like, oh, else is like, like this yeah, guy again. Kipper, it's great. <laughs> <laughs> um, so I, this is a little bit of a divergence here, but I'm curious what your thought on this is. So we talk at the firehouse about like what, you know, like this pie in the sky, like what are you going to do when this hits a certain number or you make a certain amount of money? A lot of people want to pay off their mortgage. And paying off your mortgage mm -hmm. just feels like it's a it's a huge Dave Ram Ramsey win, right? Like the, Dave Ramsey wants you to pay off your mortgage. It's a good choice for a lot of people. But when in a climate where you could potentially just take the money that would have paid off your mortgage, that I, I'm going to give you the scenario, right? Like say mm -hmm. you bought this house four years ago. You've got like a 2.75% rate. Your rate's really good. It's under inflation. It's under even what treasuries will pay you if you want to just play super safe. In that situation, would you advise someone to pay off a mortgage if they really want to? Or would you say, you know what, just buy a portfolio of treasuries and collect the difference and arbitrage the interest rate? How would you approach somebody who saw you with that idea or the dilemma uh, in front of you? In general, like, obviously it depends. There's going to be situations where it probably does make sense to pay off that mortgage. Um, most of the time, it's not going to make sense. Um, and the reason why, right, is that you can earn, like you said, a much higher yield even in holding a safe asset. Uh, safe. I use those right, right, right. air quotes here for people listening on the... Yeah, we don't want to get, don't wanna get yeah, hit YouTube. over the head with uh by the hammers on Twitter because we were recommending yeah, yeah, like, treasuries here. She thinks here. treasuries are safe. What kind of financial <laughs> planner is she? Uh, <laughs> so okay, start start sending hate mail, and I can reply to that, but it's okay. Um, so for most people, it's not going to make sense, right? For most people, right, like it's a mental accounting issue that they have that they need to sort out. And so, um, similar to what we talked about, I think on our last podcast, we were talking about sort of like the money scripts that people tell themselves. And a lot of people who yeah. have been in like the Dave Ramsey baby steps camp just think that any debt is bad. And I think that honestly, when Dave Ramsey started putting this out, I mean, we can all think about Dave Ramsey's age, right? I mean, he's not Warren Buffett's age, but he's certainly older than I am. And he certainly have seen, has seen interest rates higher than what I've seen. When my parents bought their first house, their interest rate was 18%. Like, of course, you Wild. should pay that down, right? <laughs> like, yeah. you're going to want to pay that down. When well, you unless start the to inflation get... rate's 30%, then maybe you Yeah, yeah, then maybe it's okay. So, um, but yeah, so like we start to think about it, right? And then we, we start getting in this territory where like, we're like, okay, is 6% high or is it not high, right? But if you're like squarely in the 25 to 3% camp on your mortgage, that's an extremely low interest rate. And given the environment that we're in, I'd be hard pressed to find like a real legitimate situation where like financially the numbers worked out better to do that right. right why we would end up paying that mortgage off is because emotionally that person needs to pay that mortgage off so i think when people are looking at that they need to think about okay is this an emotional decision or is this a like a really good financial decision and the only way that you're going to know that right is by running the numbers but just off the top of my head like two and a half percent mortgage there's kind of no way, right. <laughs> you know, I mean, I, I still I wouldn't recommend, let's say, like, you know, keeping a bunch of money in cash and, and doing the difference. Right. Just because, like, I mean, we've seen with, let's say, Silicon Valley Bank or these other banks. Right. I mean, I guess we're just privatizing all the or, um, you know, we're going to take all these banks and everything's going to be on the Fed's balance sheet at some point. Right. But I mean, I don't think that we really do want to be lining up around the corner with food cards. And so I think for most people, right, they still need to make a decision about where they're going to put those assets instead of paying off their mortgage. And for a lot of people, that is difficult. And that's where like it does help maybe yeah. to have a financial counselor or a financial advisor if you're in that situation. Um, but not shooting my horn here for the most part. It's not going to make sense. And so, yeah. um, yeah, just evaluate what's well, going on. Well, it's also behavioral, your right? Like, if you know you can't trust yourself to not touch the cookie jar, if you think maybe <laughs> I'm going to take the money and spend it on some dumb shit, just pay off the house then. Cause at least you kind yeah. of take your, you take it out of play. You know, it's, it, you could always go get a mortgage, I guess you could say that, but you kind of take that out of the easy access to the money out of play. But if you're, well, you can also do that to yourself. Like if you are a Bitcoiner, right, what you can do is you can set up multi-sig and then you can give one key to a, like a bunch of different, you can set up like a three of five or like, you know, a really like crazy multi-sig and you just start giving them to all your friends. And then when you want to go sell to go do something stupid, then you have to go tell all of your friends to sign this transaction with you. 
Yeah. You have to bribe your friends to get your own. Yeah, money yeah, back. yeah, exactly. You're like, yeah. okay, and I'll like actually I'll give you a bag of jelly beans and I'll also let you ride around in my Lamborghini. Exactly. <laughs> yeah. Bitcoin 2024 is moving to the heart of Bitcoin country, Nashville. Nashville just feels like the proper place for a Bitcoin conference. I can't guarantee we will be on main stage or side stage or even performing a puppet show. I can, however, say that we will be hanging out with the plebes. And if we have no obligations, we will very likely be getting drunk. Bitcoin Magazine is introducing a new event this spring, Bitcoin Asia. It's shaping up to be an unmissable experience. Stay tuned for more info. Whether you want to visit Bitcoin Asia or Bitcoin 2024 in Nashville, we have a coupon code for you. Use coupon code BCB for 10% off any ticket to either event. That's code BCB. Uh, the good advice, though, and I would say, I think you'd agree with this. If you're looking at like a, if you're staring down the barrel of a 7% interest rate right now on your mortgage, that becomes a harder choice. You're like you're for sure, you might want to sure. just pay that, that hog off. So that's, it's in that like middle range, right? Where it's like, it's not so high, but it's also not low, right? I mean, we've seen, obviously seen higher interest rates, um, but it's not a slam dunk anymore because like long-term real returns on the stock market, right, are somewhere between 7 and 8%. And so if you've got a 7% mortgage, right, you need to take significant risk. I think people often don't think about the stock market as significant risk because of how, like, commonplace it's become. You just buy an index, whatever. It's no right. big deal. And it just goes up because it's gone up mm -hmm. for the last 14 years. What can go wrong, Yeah, right? exactly. What can go wrong, right? But you are, like, you're taking on a lot of risk because you own a bunch of different companies, right, that are doing business all over the world. And so it's not necessarily that that risk isn't something you can't take on as a result of that, right? You just have to think about what your time horizon for doing so is um, and, like, whether or not you're willing to take that risk and what it would be like for you to have that that money go down. And so for some people, right, it's just going to feel better to pay off their mortgage than to do that, right? You might eke out a little bit better just by owning the stock market versus paying off your mortgage. But like in that 7% range, it's it's definitely a much more difficult decision. And that's something where I can't really tell you without looking at somebody's specific situation, right. whether or not that's something that's worth paying down or not. You had this tweet uh, yesterday, actually, somebody highlighted in the when I asked like, what should we, what should we talk about? And you highlighted some of the risks that are in equities. It's market risk, business and operational risk, financial risk, industry risk, regulatory legal risk, technological risk, competitive risk, reputation risk, geopolitical risk, currency risk, and liquidity risk. Like, I mean, if you sit down and think about it, yeah, but I would have come up with like half of that, you know, like. There's a ton There's of... There's actually more I left out. <laughs> I think somebody, somebody added some more on the bottom. There's also the bond risk, yeah. counterparty risk. There's, you know, there's, there's all sorts of other things too. So, I mean, it's, it's really interesting because like, because of the situation that we're in, right? We're in a situation now because we're being diluted out of our money, right? We have to invest. There's no situation where, like you were saying earlier, where a, a billionaire keeps a billion dollars worth of cash um, just hanging out because that doesn't make any sense. Um, you want to own assets of some kind in order to stop being diluted out of your hard earned savings. And so the result of this, though, is the financialization of just regular individual lives. And so for the average person, yeah, they probably know what the what SPY is because they have to know what SPY is. Is. And they probably don't know all the risks associated with the investing in something like SPY, but they do have these fears. Like I hear this from people when they come into my practice of like, well, I don't, the stock market seems kind of toppy. I'm not really sure what to do. I don't want to lose all my money. Like I don't want it to just vaporize. People are very nervous and afraid because they understand that there are all of those risks. They just don't know what those risks are. And yeah. so, and, and that's actually fair. They're not supposed to know what all those risks are because most people aren't actually supposed to be investing. Most people are just supposed to go to work. They're supposed to earn their paycheck. They're supposed to spend less on what they make and then they're supposed to save in their mattress like they used to right and you just can't do that anymore and yep. so <laughs> um and maybe you never really could but i think that's kind of the beauty of bitcoin is like yeah there's obviously risks associated with investing in bitcoin or sorry saving in bitcoin not investing but there's risks associated with that right but they don't compare like you kind of because it's a money it's not an investment right they don't have there's not as many risks um and i would call it the least uncertain asset as a result of that um least uncertain doesn't mean no uncertainty it means just right. less uncertain than other assets yeah and as much as we've talked about like selling bitcoin or like offloading a portion of it what we're talking what i'm talking about here is a specific situation when you have been fortunate enough to just have accumulated a massive amount of it considering like the rest of your net worth where you're just like maybe i'm a little overweight even though there's a ton of hardcore people out there that would say you can't be overweight you should be leveraged you should be at 120 percent like if that's the way you run a role, like good for you, like you send it, but just be aware that, especially if you're taking some kind of leverage like that, you, you're putting yourself on a risk spectrum that is far beyond where most people are comfortable. 
Yeah, for sure. And also, I mean, the community can say one thing, but individuals within the community do what they're going to do, right? Maybe they don't necessarily publicize that. Um, and I think that the people who have publicized it have tried to um, to help people understand why there might be situations where you would or would not want to sell. Um, there are situations where I can see why people would not want to sell, right? And there'd be plenty of other situations where it does actually make a lot of sense. And so yeah. I think, again, looking at these on a case by case basis and understanding what your situation is and why you're diversifying, right? And then making a determination about what you're diversifying into is really, really right. important instead of just sort of being irrational and emotional about it, which we all tend to be. So this is not me calling anybody out, right? Like right. I have those tendencies well, while I'm a human being, right? Like, so, but you just same need to here. pause and reflect. <laughs> but you need to also keep in mind for a lot of people who are running podcasts or like this is an influencer kind of thing too. Like when you name your podcast, Bitcoin's going to a million, you get 10 times the amount of downloads. Like people are incentivized <laughs> to tell you what you want to hear because that, you know, they have a reason to do that. Not saying that there's anyone without character in the space, but there's always a few that pop up every time we go through one of these cycles and they, they end up looking like clowns. And I think this is just bringing a little bit of reality back into the situation, which I think is healthy and people need to, to, especially when we're in these like crazy bull runs, like we've kind of been teetering around 70,000 for like three weeks now, which feels like eons, right? It feels uh -huh. like we, what, what's happening here. Why isn't Bitcoin going up another 30%? It's dying now. <laughs> yeah. Um, but it's healthy to like step back and say it might, I mean, it, it may top out at 90 grand. Who knows? Like everyone who's saying, I'm going to sell it a hundred grand. Well, you might not get that opportunity. Yeah. And you yeah. might sell it 90 grand and this thing goes to 250 grand. There's just, mm -hmm. there's no way like you're going to, you're probably going to be butthurt about what happens no matter what. So just, just understand that you, you should probably just DCA your way out the way you DCA your way in. If you have the propensity to want to sell a little bit of this asset. Yeah, I'll, Which... um, I'll say two things about that, too. I want to get back to DCA because you mentioned it. Um, but I think that people often like they just we are very quick to make decisions about things. And like instead of being quick to make decisions, I think it like even more so like just just help yourself, you know, take a minute. And um, like I think the most important thing in financial planning is this, and people hate to hear this because they want, they go to a financial planner and they ask people like me questions because they want to have the best possible outcome. And that's not what we do, right? As a financial advisor and planner, I cannot guarantee the best possible outcome. And the reason why is because I don't know the future, right? If I knew the future, then of course, yeah, sure. I'll guarantee any outcome that because I know like I can, you know, you know, manipulate, manipulate the earth and split the sea and do everything that people want me to do as a financial advisor, right? But right. in reality, right? There are best practices because those best practices on average create best outcomes, but they don't always create best outcomes. And so you should still follow best practices related to your situation where you take the time to evaluate your situation, run through the numbers, pause, reflect. Is this emotional? Is this actually financial? How, why am I doing this? If I am doing this for an emotional reason, what are the emotional reasons why I'm doing that? And do those actually mm -hmm. like justify the financial expense, right? Yep. Um, and then make that decision, right? Rather than just assuming that whoever is giving you advice on the internet is right. Um, because you know, they've been right in the past, right? There have been things that I've been right about in the past. And there have been things that I've been wrong about in the past. Like for right. instance, the ETFs, I didn't really understand kind of the, the like, to me, the magnitude wasn't as significant because I had seen people come through GBTC and they go through GBTC and then they came out into Bitcoin. And so for me, I was like, this is just a stepping stone for a lot of people. This isn't going to be a significant, not really thinking like through that, that in totality. Right. Um, and now that I'm like looking at what's happening and thinking about, it, I'm like, of course it makes sense. Right. That obviously that these large institutions are just going to park money into an ETF and they're not necessarily going to go into the cold storage. And so it's just one of many examples, obviously of me like being wrong. Yeah. Um, and then to to like further that with the dollar cost averaging, I hear what you're saying about dollar cost averaging in and dollar cost averaging out. That is a good best practice. When you're considering taxes, though, for some people, maybe dollar cost averaging out might not necessarily make sense. And so you have to actually look at your tax situation specifically, because if your dollar cost averaging throughout the year, um, it might not necessarily create the best outcome versus, let's say, waiting, depending on like what income is or what expenses are or so forth. Right. It might make sense to just sell in one year um, at one price because that's what's going make the most from it like bang for your buck from a tax perspective so also evaluate yeah. that but i think for most people on average dollar cost averaging in and out is probably going to work best okay yeah and i think what you said about um averages like everything in life is a probability set right we're all kind of just making our best decisions as you go and like anyone who's viewing anything as purely good purely bad purely black purely white um you're you're missing the forest for the trees there's so much nuance in everything and 
There's, there's just no way anyone has the answer. Um, and, and back to like people giving advice throughout the, and, and the last bull market, I, there were people prominent in the space telling um, advising people or saying like, it's a good idea to go get a second mortgage or mortgage your house and buy Bitcoin. Mm -hmm. And people were saying that kind of stuff. I, I mean, I don't know exactly, but it was in like the 50 to $55,000 range. And like any yeah. poor bastard that took that kind of advice because they heard someone say it that they respect and they've been right for years on, on, a, on a certain aspect just got railroaded and hopefully was able to hold on until now. But I doubt anyone who levered themselves to that to that height was able to not let go, you know, when this thing was at 16,000, like that mm -hmm. is just the, the kind of stomach point. turning, um, misery that the kind of person had to have gone through who took that advice. That's the kind of thing I would like to not influence people to do. Um, For sure. I don't I want do to be the guy that... that causes someone to jump off the building. Yeah. That's not yeah. what I want to do here. On the one hand, right, obviously there's freedom of speech and people are going to say what they're going to say. And people on the other side of that do need to take people's advice that don't know their specific situation with a grain of salt. On the other hand, though, I do think that people who have a lot of followers in the space need to be a little bit more responsible sometimes about what they say. And that, like they they know that there are repercussions and that people are going to take their advice. Um, and so like there are specific in influencers, right, who are maybe Bitcoin only and then started dabbling in some other coins. And then all of a sudden people are like, oh, you know, the hardcore Bitcoiners obviously like just start calling them a scammer. But for other people who are just, you know, entering the space innocently don't necessarily know what's going on. And so like your dead example, I, I can think of five podcasts off the top of my head that I heard during that time where I would just be like, oh gosh no stop you know <laughs> yeah. um and so and then like you know the voices like me are we're kind of quiet you know we're, we're like hey no don't do that um and people it's well, not as exciting you know to like just buy and hold morgan you need to be more of a demagogue here i need to hear some <laughs> fury i need to hear some reckless advice yeah. telling people to yellow into bitcoin at seventy thousand dollars mortgage everything sell your children exactly i mean i think Bitcoin from the financial planning community i'm already like that they're like this psycho girl who like thinks people <laughs> should own bitcoin at all like this vapor tulip garbage are they kidding like what is she talking about you know it's um, hard to believe that anyone would be in that camp at, i mean at, at this day and age like with, especially with etf approval all of the i mean the biggest etf um opening ever it's hard to believe that there's still people in that camp but i mean i i meet them there's there's a lot of apprehension still but the really the bottom line, I think, is that there's just so much misunderstanding of what this actually is. It's yeah, really sure. hard to get through to people that are, you know, traditional finance minded because there is so much background you need to fill in on. Like the history of money is a huge one. Like how many, mm -hmm. how many, how many uh, civilizations have blown up their money over the years? Every single one of them. There's not a single one that hasn't done it. And when you start to like, I don't know if you've read this, but Nick Zabo wrote this piece. I think it was in 2002 called shelling out and it's one of my favorite pieces about the history of money he goes like all the way back to the paleolithic era brings it all the way forward it's a lot like um struggling to think of the book off the top of my head now sapiens it's a lot like that mm -hmm. where they kind of he kind of goes through this whole sociological evolution of money and makes a great case way before bitcoin of how and why digital money is going to be such a big deal yeah, um, and you know, Nick Zabo obviously had a hand in a lot of this as well. Could be related, or Satoshi himself, who knows? But the guy is a genius. I mean, that piece is phenomenal. Everyone listening should read it. Yeah, I uh, I, I tend to agree that um, that the the advisor education is lacking for sure, um, and it's also because. For the majority of them, right, they've learned maybe Keynesian economics and they haven't learned anything besides that. And so what right. they're seeing right now is just, oh, that's just what people do, right? They're not necessarily that interested in going that far back right. and understanding, okay, the history of money and yeah, how like, what the implications of, of these things are. Definitely does. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah, it definitely we're uh definitely on the like in some sort of strange I know people call us a cult. I don't necessarily think that, but like most Bitcoiners, right? Especially ones who are, let's say, going on your podcast or who are evangelizing people about Bitcoin, right? And talking about Bitcoin all the time. Like, we're a strange group of people. Like, let's be honest. Yeah. We are maybe not all aligned all the time, which is probably for the best also. Um, but we all have, like, something a little off in our brains um, that makes us... <laughs> <laughs> yeah. like yeah let's just like go off the grid and start this new money right and so um i think to expect that from the average advisor right is is asking a lot uh, and so that these things are definitely going to take time for them um but they're getting there right and so and now that there is an etf i think that the average advisor is going to have to do the education to make sure that they do know because 
clients are going to ask about it, right? And they can no longer say, oh, I don't have a way for you to buy that. Yeah. Now they do. And hopefully they get some education. Hmm. Um, I know you don't want to put a number out there, but I'm just curious. What are you, what are you, what are your feelings about what's going on right now with this bull run? It seems like it's taken a little bit of a break. The halving's happening in a week or so, which is usually the impetus that causes these kinds of things to happen like six months to, you know, eight, nine months from now. It seems like we've started very early and obviously that's related to the ETF and all of the, you know, hubbub about that. Do you, th do you think we're like midway through this thing or do you think we're towards the beginning still? Are you? Any, yeah, anything at all. Great question. And I will start this with, I will probably be wrong. So if you were going to make decisions about your retirement based on what I'm about to we say, love to speculate, though, you are we? way off <laughs> and you should consult a real financial advisor. Yeah. So I'll just start <laughs> there. Um, I actually think that we're very early and I think that the cycle is not going to look anything like any other cycles because of the ETF. Um, so I at first thought that the ETF really wasn't going to be that big of a deal. Um, I was obviously wrong there. And now that I'm seeing what's going on, I think that it's actually going to be a significant factor this time. Um, and that I think that the pace at which things are going to occur may take longer, actually, than it typically does. Um, but again, like I always say stuff like that and people are always like, you're wrong, you're an idiot. So again, I'll caveat it with that. But I do think that this time we have a steady inflow of people coming in. But also, right, you've got these people who maybe most of them are going to be buy and hold long-term investors or whatever in these ETF products. And I'm saying investor because they are holding that product. They are not holding Bitcoin outright, okay? Right. Um, so don't send me hate mail over that. Um, they are holding Bitcoin, right, in, in these custodial accounts. Um, and maybe they expected with the having that, like, something's going to happen and therefore they're just going to get in, get out or, you know, make a quick trade or whatever. And so I think there are those people in the market now, too, that have easy access and easy ability to do this. And then there's going to be the long term allocators that are going to sort of be in the mix of this, too, of like, OK, are there um, institutional investors that are just coming in and putting, you know, between one and five percent of their portfolio and something like this now, because now they actually can do that and it's not a big deal to do it. And so you're going to have like just a, just a large swath of people and then the usual people who are like, OK, they're starting to learn about Bitcoin. There's all the new orange pilled people who are going down the rabbit hole, like every cycle where they get really involved and they get, you know, super crazy and they make everyone in their household crazy because all they want to do is talk about Bitcoin, right? Those people are still there too. And so, <laughs> and then there's like the 15 years of history of other people who are still, who are in it and are still in it and who are not selling, right? And so I think that this is like a really interesting time. Um, and that obviously doesn't necessarily mean that there, we're going to go to a million or trillion or whatever people think that we're going to go to, but I do <laughs> think that trillion, yeah. it's going to be choppy um, and that it's going to be an extended bull market. Like, I think that this goes on for a while and that the having like we're probably going to see again with the having because all of a sudden there's going to be less supply on the market there's going to be less people selling there's yep. going to be these strange sellers that are coming in i think it's going to be really choppy and it's and people are going to get whiplash and it's not going to look like it used to yeah it's going to be interesting especially because we have this gbtc that continues to bleed bitcoin while they kind of circle it back into to blackrock but when when gbtc is finally a dead carcass that doesn't have any more bitcoin to sell or it's just they're just done and you have this having event happening like that's i think when things are going to get really interesting and i haven't done the math to figure out i know some people have kind of speculated in the next three months or so at the rate they're bleeding they should be pretty much blood out by then so it could get really interesting this summer yeah i mean i think the other thing to consider with gbtc that people aren't really factoring in is that maybe they just cut their fee and it stops bleeding right like the reason why they haven't cut their fee is because they haven't had to but if it they start like, to see outflows to the point you, where they have to cut their fee they're going to cut their fee i can't imagine running that show right now and not cutting mm -hmm. that fee like you've already lost yeah. i think they're at like a 50 percent. their 50 percent of their bitcoins already bled out not dropping that fee seems i don't know i just don't understand it it yeah, make any I'm sense. with you on that. I mean, I think that like if they had made a smart business decision at the beginning, they would have cut their fee to where everybody else was just because then people wouldn't have left. Right. Yeah. A lot of people would have been like, oh, I just own an ETF now. Great. Why bother? Yeah. Well, yeah. there's also the tax. I think maybe they thought, oh, there's so many people that hold this that would have to take a bath on taxes if they sell mm -hmm. it. We can hold them here. They're just going to bleed slowly. They're not going to get bludgeoned like they will by yep. Uncle Sam. And um, I think they might have miscalculated there. But yeah. I, I think they might have miscalculated there too, because I think there's some people who just don't care. Um, and yeah. who are like, whatever, I'll just take the tax. Well, loss especially if and, it's a, a lot of people, yeah. I think myself <laughs> included <laughs> owned that in a tax advantaged account. So if mm -hmm. I'm selling out yeah, of there, there's a lot of that going on too. There's no taxes, you know, not yet mm -hmm. at least. So that's probably a big part <laughs> of it. Yeah, for sure. 
Um, any thoughts on micro strategy? That's been such a volatile, interesting uh, stock to be watching and partaking in a little bit. Yeah, definitely. So I will preface this with, um, while I do have a CFA charter, I am not a fundamental analysis of, uh, analyst of stocks. Um, and so that's just simply not what I do, but that said, I do know, <laughs> I do know a thing or two about microstrategy. Um, so what I will say is this for most people, right? MicroStrategy is going to have a lot of the risks associated with just buying a company, right? It's still an operating company that has a business that has revenues coming in and has uh, has expenses going out, right? And some of those expenses are actually the interest burden on the debt that they purchased to buy Bitcoin. And so, yeah, it's a leveraged bet, obviously, on Bitcoin, right? But there are other factors in that company that I think people are neglecting to to think about. Um, and so there are it's definitely, I, what, what I would say about it is that it's riskier. Um, yeah. And so if you are just looking to kind of have a plain vanilla portfolio where you are trying to minimize uncertainty, right? MicroStrategy is not for you. If you're like, okay, I want to take a little levered bet on Bitcoin, but I don't necessarily want to mortgage my house to do it or, you know, go to like the Bitfinexes of the world. I don't even know if that's still a thing where you do like, you know, either. 100 million times leverage. Yeah, they saw you, yeah, 100x <laughs> leverage where you get knocked out in like three seconds when the price moves yeah, 1%. Yeah, they're yeah. Like, this is Love the it. way that people can kind of get their crack but not be like totally <laughs> you know <laughs> right um and so there's something to think about in in that regard though of like okay the company itself is still taking leverage um and you know maybe they've got to roll their bonds at a higher interest rate or whatever it is right like at some point they might have some issues um or not right it could be totally fine everything could go dandy and everything will just be great and maybe it does outperform bitcoin over time um me personally that's not something we're recommending that clients do if the client wants to buy it i'm not going to be like you're kicked out we right. can't come here anymore. You know, we just explain the risks associated with doing it. Um, I do think, though, what people are doing is that they're hoping that MicroStrategy goes up more than Bitcoin as a result of this, especially during the halving, and therefore that they don't have to maybe evaluate their spending and their savings rates as much because it's going to multiply much right. more quickly. And so that's often what I'm seeing with this is like, maybe start at the more simple part, which is not simple for people, right? It's hard work. It's a lot harder for people to be like, okay, this is the income I have coming, coming in. Maybe I can increase that. Or these are yep. the expenses I have going out. Maybe I I can decrease this. Maybe I can create more of a reserve. Maybe now I can save more, which is what I'm supposed to be doing rather than trying to take these extra risky bets on these other things so that my retirement pans out a little bit better than it otherwise would. Yep. Great advice. Um, Morgan, do you have anything else? Uh, do you want to give a pass on your, uh, I'm sorry, your financial planning business? Um, anything else you want to share before we uh, end this thing? Yeah. So, um, you can find me at uh, Morgan with an E on Twitter. Uh, my husband and I run a podcast. It's called Bitcoin for Advisors. Um, we have been very delinquent in putting those out. In fairness, though, we have a, a lot, lot of work. going on. Yeah. <laughs> and so um, it's just been really hard to schedule with our two schedules. But we do have plans to get an episode out this year, I promise. Um, and so that's something you can listen to. There's a lot of Bitcoin education, though, in those in like the previous podcasts that we put out. So check that out. I am working on a book. Um, it is slow going, but the book is Bitcoin Personal Finance. So if you would like to be on um, a, wait, a list of people who know when that comes out, um, there's just a landing page. I'm collecting emails. I'm not collecting anything else. You don't have to share your whole life story to me. Just put your email in there. And when the book comes out, eventually <laughs> I'll be like, hey, my book's out, you know. Um, yeah. So there's a landing page there. It's BitcoinPersonalFinanceBook.com. Um, I also have a consulting practice. Um, so if you just need some help with your Bitcoin or custody or whatever it is, you can reach me there. It's MoneyOwners.com. And my financial planning practice is Origin wa.com um, financial planning is going to encompass bitcoin but also regular traditional financial assets and so if you're the kind of person like we were talking about earlier who's looking to diversify maybe need some help of where um, that's a great place to go there's not just me though there's other financial advisors so please if you reach out to me and we're not a good fit i'm happy to point you in the right direction we want happy clients not people who you know are just here because they don't think that they have any other option and so that's like the last person i want in my practice is like i have to use you so right that doesn't sound <laughs> like, like you have much going on here i mean yeah yeah, yeah. So what are you doing you... with yourself morgan <laughs> If you'd like to use me and you think we'd be a good fit, feel free to reach out. But again, not offended if I'm not a good fit for people because I understand that, you know, we're all unique in some way or another. So, yeah. Yeah. Awesome. I'm looking forward to that book. I will definitely buy one. I think that will be popular, actually. I think a lot of people have a lot of questions related to this. 
Yeah, for sure. And it's actually been eye opening for me, too, as I've been doing research for the book um, of like changing how we approach some people's financial planning. Specifically, I mean, the retirement stuff we were talking about earlier is all the result of me doing research for this book because of like trying to say, how do you do retirement planning with Bitcoin? Because it is different. Um, and I actually ran these crazy spreadsheets trying to like figure out what the right withdrawal rate was. And then I had like this aha moment of like, oh, it doesn't compound. None of this makes any sense. Like, I just need to use a divisor. <laughs> so yeah all right well thank you for joining um it was a great conversation learned a lot yeah thanks so much for having me josh uh tell danny missed out and yeah till next yeah, time i will i will definitely tell him. thank you <laughs> yeah <laughs>